Let's start with the second talk of this session. So now we have uh, Niklas. Uh, uh, sorry. Galke, right? Niklas Galke. Yeah. Niklas Galke, yeah. Who's going to talk about sufficiency of running divergences. So Niklas, please, floor is yours. Yes, thanks. So exactly, I'm going to talk about this problem to you, uh, which is which I've been working on together with Laurits van Leuk and uh, Henry Gwilming, both at the University of Hanover. And this problem has an abundance of literature that has looked at related problems, special cases, things like that. I'm not going to run through all of that, but still, um, I so I'm going to, to introduce this problem to you and um, what we have done in order to like attack this problem. Um, so I, I'm going to start by, by stating the data processing inequality. Many of you are probably familiar with it. So given you have some quantum divergence and a quantum channel, if you apply your channel to a pair of states, this pair of states cannot become more distinguishable with respect to this divergence that satisfies the DPI. Um, and also many, many divergences, many quantum divergences additionally satisfy a recovery map result like most famously due to Pets and his family of, of uh, Rennie divergences and the, the quantum relative entropy, um, which states that if you do not only have the inequality, but actually equality, then there exists a map, sometimes completely positive, sometimes not, that takes you back to the original state, uh, pair of states. Now, the problem that we want to look at is very closely related to this recovery problem. Right, so in both cases, we look at uh, pairs of states, pairs of quantum states. And in both cases, we talk about equality of some quantum divergence. So for the recovery uh, problem, what we have is we, we have given the two pairs of states and a quantum channel that connects the two pairs. And if we then assume that we have equality of, well, suitable quantum divergence, then we get the recovery map. Now, the problem of sufficiency, which is like the name is related to the name, to the problem of statistical sufficiency, um, is that we assume the equality not for a single divergence, but for a family of divergences. But in return, like by strengthening this assumption, we do not need to assume that we already have a channel that connects the two pairs. And then what we want to deduce is that, is that we can actually go from one pair to the other, and then by the recovery result, for example, go back. So this is the problem. I'm going to state it again in formulae in, ca uh, in case you, you prefer that. Um, so first of all, this is the definition of the, of the Rennie divergences that you've been waiting for since the, the previous talk. And um, this is the, the family that we, will, that we will be looking at, right? So we, we call a generalization of this classical Rennie divergences, a quantum generalization sufficient if from equality of the divergences on some open interval for the parameter, you can deduce that you have um, maps going back and forth between the pairs of states. So I didn't state that these will be quantum channels because we will see that in general, you cannot deduce that. Uh, but of, of course, a priori, that would have been the hope, right? We'd like to, to get quantum channels. So the main question that we, that we looked at is that does there exist a sufficient family of quantum Rennie divergences because now I have to find this this um, this property of being sufficient, but no one tells you that this is actually something that exists. Um, so this is a question that I will be talking about, and I will tell you that in the classical case they exist, and it's the the classical Rennie divergences. And I will also tell you that in the quantum case we don't know if they exist, but I will give you some some results about which one could be sufficient, which one could not. Um, right, so we start with the classical case. And basically what I'm stating is if you have probability measures to two pairs um, such that you have this equality, then these two, two pairs, also called dichotomies, they are actually interconvertible via positive loops. And how do we prove that? The, the proof is basically via some kind of normal form. Uh, so what we do, we start with these abstract probability measures on some space. And what we construct is we give you a measure mu 
on this uh, extended real line, like the right. So um, such that we can interconvert this P and Q with this other dichotomy, which is mu and some absolute decontinuous measure. Well, the absolute continuity is a bit tricky, but at least it looks like it's absolutely continuous. Um, and then from this normal form, by taking another, uh, another dichotomy and going to their normal form, you get the interconvertibility provided that the, that the Rennie divergences coincide on some open interval, which is basically due to injectivity of the Laplace transform. And this measure mu is constructed by taking this function, which you know from the, from the definition of the Rennie divergences. And then you basically just take the, the push forward measure with respect to this function. And that gives you this, this dichotomy, this normal form. Right. So for example, for probability vectors, what this does basically is that you take the, the ratios of the probabilities of your probability vectors then you collect all of them that are equal. You sum, right? You can kind of integrate out the level sets of this, of this ratio. And that gives you the normal form, basically. Cool. This is the classical result. But here we are in a quantum conference. So I'd like to talk a bit more about the quantum case. And the first result I would like to show you is some kind of quantum analog of this uh, normal form. It's related to the quasi moto theorem, which has appeared in a couple of talks already. And it states that if you have some family of quantum states indexed by some theta, uh, then you can decompose your Hilbert space in this form, right? You have a couple of, of blocks and the blocks themselves have a product structure, bipartite structure. And you have some additional, additional conditions because otherwise this is not really informative. So the first is that you can decompose your state in this, in this block form, in this way, right? So you have some probability. Then you have the, the blocks, which is on the one factor, some row j theta, some state. And on the other block, and this is the more important part, you have another state, omega j, which does not depend on theta. It only depends on j. So it's some kind of multiplicity, but you can have, I'll change it a little bit. Um, but you can have uh, like, different probabilities depending on, on which dimension you want to weigh. And you have a, um, an additional, an additional um, condition on maps, which have this family as fixed points, which is that if every map that fixes all of the row theta simultaneously uh, restricts to a map of this form uh, on each of the blocks, where this uh, channel in the second entry fixes each of the omega j, right? And this essentially makes this decomposition unique in a certain way. Now, if we have this form, what we can do is we can trace out the omega j in each block. Uh, and we can also tensor them back. And that gives us a possibility of interconverting the original family with this kind of minimal form of, the, of this family that you get by just removing all of the omega j. And in the classical case for probability vectors, if you do that, it actually just gives you back the normal form for probability measures that I explained to you on the slide before. So we have some hope that this might be some tool that you can use in order to prove the quantum case, provided that it's true. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So one corollary that you can get more or less immediately from this decomposition that I've been talking about in the minimal form is that you have that two families are interconvertible via a quantum channel, if and only if the minimal forms are blockwise unitarily equivalent. So in every block, you have a unitary that, that maps one family to the other one, right? Because you have this joint block decomposition and um, this, this is equivalent. And the proof basically goes like this. Uh, well, first of all, we know that we can interconvert with a minimal form, right? So we can assume that we have minimal already. One direction is done. The other direction, um, we take the, like we assume that we have R and S that interconvert between the families. And then we look at their compositions. Those are maps, completely positive maps that uh, fix all the rho theta or all the sigma theta, however you like. Um, and therefore, by Kwashimoto, 
we have a um, we have a decomposition of this map that restricts to something kind of easy, kind of simple on each block, right? And then there are some um, abstract results in C-star algebras and the paper by Caddison that uh, tell you that, okay, these, these restrictions to each block, they already need to be mutually inverse unit trees. And then thereby you get this, um, this corollary. We also have some no teleportation type result, which um, relates to the Kwashi Emoto form in this way, that if you assume that um, the blocks that are allowed to be theta dependent in your Kwashi Emoto decomposition, that they are all one dimensional. So basically just a number and then the, all the, the, um, the state is, is in the omega j, like the multidimensionality. Uh, then you get that is, this is equivalent to your family already being interconvertible with, with classical states. Or in other words, that the rho theta themselves already commute, right? So you can only interconvert commuting states with commuting states. It's not possible to have non-commuting states and interconvert them with commuting ones. Um, and well, another condition that you get is that the the family are is a family of joint fixed points of some entanglement breaking channel. So some channel that factorizes through a classical system, which is kind of natural from the from point two, let's say. Um, so this is kind of no go result that tells you how to rule out certain divergences, and I will tell you later how we apply that. Um, there's also some a, a property or function which is called complete monotonicity which we found to be related to this question of sufficiency of a, of a family of Rennie divergences. And for that, we assume that we have that this limit, which is kind of the, what do you say, like maybe the max relative entropy or something like that, that this exists. So if you have that, then the following are equivalent. So you, you have a classical dichotomy that has the same It has the same uh, Rennie divergences as your quantum dichotomy. And the following function, which is a little bit ugly, but it's okay, uh, is completely monotone, which means that if you take the nth derivative and multiply it with minus one to the n, so you, you alternate the sign, this is uh, basically like monotone. So alternatingly, monotonely decreasing or increasing strictly. So these also are, are equivalent. And again, this might be one possibility of ruling out um, families of, uh, of, um, of divergences because, well, it relates to the, to the slide before. If you, if you can actually show that this is true for some family of Rennie divergences, then you know, okay, there are uh, classical divergences with equal divergence, uh, sorry, there's a classical dichotomy with equal divergences. And therefore, by the previous slide, you cannot interconvert. Like it cannot be sufficient. Because otherwise, um, otherwise you would get existence of uh, interconverting maps between the classical and non-classical uh, dichotomy and the non-classical one. Well, you can choose it to be non-commuting. We also have some negative results. Um, so the first is that any family of anti-unitarily invariant um, divergences cannot be sufficient for detecting uh, interconvertibility via completely positive maps, right? That is because, uh, well, you cannot in general convert a state and its complex conjugate via a completely positive map. Um, but if you're anti-unitarily invariant, you cannot, uh, you, you, get, you have the same like uh, random divergences, therefore cannot be sufficient for complete positivity. There's Bad news and some good news associated to that. The bad news is that all Rennie divergences that we know are anti-unitarily equivalent. So, so far there's no chance of getting completely positive interconvertibility. Uh, the good news is that um, all families that we know also satisfy the data processing inequality for positive maps on some interval, right? So we can still hope that, uh, that there's a, a sufficient family um, for for uh, positive interconvertibility, interconvertibility via positive maps. Um, so that is what we will we will have in mind now, right? 
completely positive is off the table, we can look at positive. Now, even if we do that, if we assume that we want uh, positive interconvertibility, we can rule out a couple of divergences. So for example, the PETS type uh, quantum Rennie divergences, which are a special example of the standard F divergences, um, they cannot be sufficient even for positive interconvertibility because there is, exist the Nussbaum scholar distributions, which are classical distributions with the same divergences. Same for the geometric one, which is a special case of the maximal F divergence. Ah, sorry, yeah. Ah, thanks. It's just a special case for the maximal F divergences. There we have Matsumoto's minimal reverse test, which again gives you classical divergences with the same clip. Classical dichotomies with the same divergences. I don't. I don't know how many times I've confused the two terms already. Um, right. Um, okay. So these two families, pets and geometric, we can rule out for sure. They cannot be sufficient. Um, and then there's the last sad fact, which is that the quasi motor de decomposition, which we would hope to be useful for, for answering the quantum case is not good in the setting of positive maps because there are, there are dichotomies for which um, you have positive interconvertibility, but the structure you get from the quasi moto theorem is different, has a different number of blocks. So the quasi moto decomposition is not an invariant for, for interconvertibility with positive maps and therefore by itself not the right. Okay. We also have some, some, some hope, some, some positive evidence, namely for the sandwich quantum, for the sandwich Rennie divergence. Um, I didn't put the definition here because it's not it's kind of complicated, not really useful for what I'm going to tell you. Um, our intuition is that due to the formula, the words in rho and sigma that you get are sufficiently complicated to get enough information about the, the relation between the two states out. Um, so what we have for these is that we can show that there, uh, that in general, you cannot find uh, classical distributions with equal Rennie divergences. So the trick that we use to rule out pets and geometric will not work, right? Second is we did some numerics to, to check the, the complete monotonicity of this map F. And also there, so far, we couldn't find an example of a dichotomy where you don't have the complete monotonicity um, for the for the sandwich rendered divergence. The last is that what we could prove is that if both um, both dichotomies contain a pure state, then equality of the sandwich rendered divergences actually tells you that there is a completely positive map going from one to the other and back. And here the constraint with the anti-unitary invariance doesn't apply. Well, basically because the two states are pure. So if you if you write it down, you can you can you can see that it doesn't give a problem. Um, so therefore we think that the sandwich, like the family of sandwich Rennie divergences might be sufficient for detecting at least positive uh, interconvertibility. And well, that's kind of the, the hope that we have, and that is where we would like to, to look and see if that is actually true. So I have some directions where one would like, like if one would like to, to tackle the problem, to answer the question, might want to start. So the first is that if you can find an example of true catalysis, right? So you tensor with the catalyst, you thereby you get convertibility but you know that the original ones were not already convertible via positive maps. If you find that, then you can rule out the sandwiched, uh, the family of sandwich divergences. Um, another one would be, maybe we just didn't try hard enough to extend the classical proof or the one for pure states to apply to a general quantum setting. Might be, might be a way. We didn't see any way of doing it, but, but uh, I cannot exclude that we just didn't we just didn't see it. Um, another one would be maybe to find a divergence that is not invariant under transposition. So I put divergence here in scare quotes because um, 
like a divergence is kind of an information theoretic quantity, right? While the question between positivity and complete positivity is a question about entanglement. So why should the divergence that measures distinguishability of two states be able to say tell you something about this this like general entanglability question? But still, maybe there's some some quantity that is divergence like that can that can do that. And the last point is that if we can adapt the Koashimoto decomposition to positive maps, then maybe that's a tool that you might use to, to answer the question. And that seems to go in the direction of Jordan algebras. And yeah, with that, I would like to thank you and I'm open to questions. Thanks, Nicholas, for the nice talk. Are there any questions? Yeah, over there, there's one. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I wonder if I can ask two small questions. The f okay. The first is uh, about the the geometric divergences. As you said, that there are the kind of you can see them as like a kind of like the Nussbaum score. You you can find the like a preparation method for them, but to my understanding, it's only extends for alpha at most two. So technically after alpha greater than two, we don't really know for that. So so could it be technically possible that for alpha greater than two, those could still be uh, sufficient? Uh, I don't know if this is the... the Potentially. I'm I'm not I, I'm not hundred percent percent sure about the the ranges of alpha that uh, that we that we dealt with in the paper. Uh, if you know the book by Hiai on, on F divergences, we use the same range of alpha that he uses. Okay. So if he only goes until two, well, to my understanding, it only works until alpha right. goes to two. Then then maybe potentially you can you can. Oh, that would be weird. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So maybe, maybe yes, maybe that's something you can try as well. Okay. Uh, and a second question, if I may. Uh, I'm, as you said, this is a quantum <laughs> meeting, but I'm, I have a very classical question. Yeah. That you, you had a complete proof for the, for the classical case. What if you um, ask the same question that you kind of want to transform multiple? measures into multiple, like you, you ask the sufficiency for like uh, similar transformations of multiple, not only two, but multiple probability. So, uh, so the measures. question is if the classical proof extends to, to a family that does not, like to larger families than pairs. Yes. Um, uh, of course, the same also could be done in quantum side, but that's just uh, beyond. I, I don't know. I, we, we haven't tried it explicitly. In principle, what you need is some is that the, so we, we assume uh, more or less absolute continuity, right? If you have multiple measures, maybe you can just sum them to get something that is that has sufficiently large support, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then basically do the same proof, but with respect to a measure that itself is not part of the family to, to transform to the real line uh, and thereby get an analogous result. But I don't know, we, we haven't tried. Okay, thanks. Are there questions from the audience? Oh, if not, then maybe I can ask a question. So sure. um, there are also more exotic families or constructions of F divergences and things like that. Uh, have you looked at them or, uh, or um, like have you considered variations of this problem for, for these divergences? So, I mean, okay. So there are a couple of families of of any divergences that um, that we didn't look at in particular, like the ones that we dealt with more or less in, in detail, are the the pets one, the geometric one, and the sandwich. I know, but like even going beyond, let's say, Rennie, other maybe you could consider other sorts of divergences. You see, if you could study um, this dimension, like like how how exotic, like alpha z, or even more. Uh, like I mean, that's still some kind of Rennie, right? Yeah, but yeah, if you yeah. include the z. It's not anymore. It's a family of of mm -hmm. uh, families, right? mm -hmm. yeah. um, which includes the sandwich and the pets. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so in some sense, you, you would have more hope, right? Um, especially if the conjecture about the sandwich one is true, it's true about the alpha Z. Um, more exotic than that, I don't know. Like, do you have something specific in mind? Yeah, no, I was thinking if you go beyond any divergences, okay. you can consider F divergences. Uh, okay, well, so so the okay, so about the F divergences, the the, the no go ones for for pets and and geometric, well, they they don't really depend on the on restricting to to the Rennie subfamily. Let's say they mm -hmm. work for the for the for the general F divergences. Maybe one thing that one should say is that. If you take the F divergences, actually, what you can what you can show, which has been shown by Matsumoto, is that they are sufficient for determining uh, like convertibility. So if you have F di like dichotomies with classical dichotomies um, such that the 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 F, the maximal let me make a difference like the F divergences, all F divergences satisfy an inequality. You can go from one to the other via a stochastic map. Um, if you restrict to the to the Rennie, that breaks down because of catalysis and additivity. You, you become additive, so catalysis rules out this possibility. Um, but still, in the quantum case, uh, like the fully quantum case, also the, the, the full family of F divergences that we know, maybe apart from measured ones, I don't know about those, but it's maybe more a classical quantum uh, thing, uh, you can rule out. Thanks. Okay, then uh, I guess let's uh, thank the speaker again.